Okay, now another peculiar form of synesthesia, which I'll tell you about, was discovered also by Galton. He pointed out if you take people in the population, often the same people who have synesthesia, but sometimes not, and you ask them to imagine numbers, they'll say, oh, I can imagine numbers. Where are the numbers? He'll say one is here, two is here, three is here, four is here, five is here, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and he'll draw an elaborate virtual line in space, convoluted, something sometimes doubling back in itself. And this was called number forms or number lines by Galt. And of course, everybody ignored it. People said, for 100 years, people said, well, it exists, but who knows what to make of it. Maybe they're just making it up. So again, we have to show this is a real phenomenon. By the way, it sort of reminds you of people like Einstein and other mathematicians saying that they have numerical landscapes in the brain. It numbers are spatially represented, and they wander these landscapes to discover hidden relationships. Well, is this mumbo jumbo, or can you study it scientifically? Well, these patients, these not patients, these people, allow you to approach this problem scientifically. The first thing we did was to show that it's real. How do you do that? Well, there's a famous effect called a number distance effect, which you can try on normal people. We all have a vague number line of sorts, because numbers begin to the left, one, two, three, four, and they sort of, but you don't, you can see one here if I want to, okay? There's no compulsion that you have to see it here. But you have a vague number line. If you give a person two numbers, five and six, which is bigger? Six, okay, he's a bit slow today, but six. Which is bigger, 19 or 2? 19. <laughs> okay. So generally, if you do this systematically, what you find is the further apart two numbers are, the quicker the answer and more accurate. If they're close together, people are slow. He was slow, as you notice. Okay? Now, why is that? If it's just a lookup table, it shouldn't matter how far apart the numbers are. So the suggestion was there's a scalar representation of numbers somewhere in the brain, and if they're close together, it's easier to confuse them, and that's why you confuse them and you take a longer time. So we said, we asked the obvious question. We said, if you have a convoluted number line, and 3 is actually closer to 8 than it is to 2, what determines the reaction time and accuracy? Is it the distance in Cartesian space, in physical space, or distance in numerical space that determines the reaction time? The answer is, it's strongly influenced by this shortcut distance rather than by that distance, showing once again the reality of Galton's number lines, that these things do exist. And many of these make the point they can inspect the line from different angles, see hidden relationships. One of the things we have observed was at the kinks in these lines, you find numerical computation is more difficult. They make a lot of errors. Whereas across the non-kinky regions, they make fewer errors. So this is really does exist in your brain. Now the next question is why and where? Well, I think I have a hunch about this. Numbers are abstract, and your brain has not evolved to cope with numbers and sequence and numerical concepts. Space is very primitive. Your Devonian fish-like ancestors had to represent space. So what you do in a sort of Lakoffian way is you have to map. Here is some abstract idea, and you can't deal with it. You map it onto space and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And that's how you cope with numbers because computation in an abstract mathematical space is simply not possible. If there is some error in that mapping, okay, something convoluted happens, and you get this convoluted number line. So that's the hunch about what's going on in these people. And so, uh, what else? Let me look, look at my notes quickly. I'm almost done. Oh, yes, some of the number lines are in 3D. And in fact, I would venture uh, the location. We don't know this for sure yet. Um, I would suggest that it's also in this region of the angular gyrus. So, there might be a spatial representation of sequence there, numerical sequence. And I'm predicting if you zap it with TMS and you're planning to try this, the number line would disappear. He could say, oh, I can imagine the numbers anywhere I want to. Okay. Okay, one final point. I lost my notes, but let me get in there. Okay, final point, because I was talking about pruning of connections, right? I was going to talk about evolution of language, but I'm going to skip that and talk about instead. We're talking about pruning of connections, but there's also biochemical influences on synesthesia. For example, it's been known anecdotally, people who take LSD claim that they have synesthesia. And this has never been confirmed in formal studies, but I tend to believe it because it's much more common in Berkeley than here. Okay? <laughs> And especially when you use LSD, it's claimed that there's an increase in synesthesia. And that gave me the clue, and this is experiment, this work I, I did with David Brang, a graduate student in my lab, 
who, as you know, may have guessed, prepared the slide. Okay. <laughs> so uh, LSD, we know, activates serotonin uh, type 2, uh, 2A receptors. So it gave us the hunch 2A receptors may be involved in synesthesia. And then I came across two people who, when they took Prozac, their synesthesia disappeared. Right? So why would that happen? Well, it turns out Prozac causes increase in activation of serotonin type 1A, which in turn, we know, decreases, down-regulates serotonin 2A, which, of course, is going to eliminate synesthesia, if our theory is correct about S2 receptors being involved in synesthesia. And finally, clinching this, a person took melatonin. We have a student who took melatonin, about 5 milligrams, and for the first time in her life experienced synesthesia. Saw colors with numbers. And here again, there's a down -reg regulation of 1A receptors, causing an increase in the activation of 2A, thereby leading to synesthesia. So all of this fits, and we know that, so what I'm arguing is that's the synesthesia receptor. Just as I made the prediction that it's cross connections in the fusiform gyrus, and DT imaging now confirms that prediction, I'm now predicting, along with David, that the two way receptors are the synesthesia receptors, at least for some types of synesthesia. And the gene involved is in chromosome 13, which has been identified. So the bottom line is you can start. One final point I want to make is about, let's go back to the brain diagram, is that we have seen many patients with damage to the angular gyrus of the left, left side of the brain, which receives information from vision, from hearing, from touch, to the crossroads, and is a center for polymodal convergence of information, and is especially big in humans. And let, going back to metaphors, what I found was damage to this gyrus leads to metaphor blindness. So somehow it's involved in uh, the genesis of metaphor. Now, why that happens is anybody get, anybody's guess, but we also know that these people have problems with naming things, coming up with words. It's called enomia. Now let's think about metaphors. Let's take a word like Juliet and the sun. How are you able to link that, and how could that possibly have anything to do with synesthesia? You're talking about two abstract ideas. But think about this. A word like Juliet or the word like sun, in fact, we think of it as having infinite implications affecting the entire brain. That's not true, right? It has a finite set of implications. Sun is radiant. It's warm. Now, there are irrelevant things like it's uh, made of helium or it's got a lot of energy or it's hot and things like that. Similarly, now, each association can in turn generate several more, and it's geometric, right? So there are clouds of association like an echo spreading out. Similarly, the same thing with Juliet has a set of associations, but they overlap in a, in a region, and that's what generates a metaphor. And what happens in synesthesia is because of this hyperconnectivity gene, you get more connections, creating a, creating a bigger penumbra of, of associations, causing greater overlap, and therefore a greater propensity for metaphorical thinking. So, last slide. Is, here's an opportunity for us to go from the genes, if you, if you clone, if you get a large enough family and clone it, or set of genes, and I've told you about where I think it is, and um, uh, which chromosome is involved and which receptor is involved. So you can start with genes, go to brain anatomy, um, uh, fusiform gyrus for lower synesthetes, angular gyrus for higher synesthetes, number line, angular gyrus. Cross-wiring throughout the brain for creativity. You can go to perceptual psychophysics, the pop-out effect, the uh, effect of luminance contrast, all the way to metaphor, abstract thinking, Shakespeare, number theory, okay? And as Pat would say, hierarchical reductionism is not bad reductionism, okay? So in fact, here's an opportunity to span the entire spectrum, starting from genes and uh, uh, biochemistry of synesthesia all the way to Shakespeare's metaphor. Thank you.